Welcome to the Argue With Me podcast. Um, in this episode, I have a guest on named Matthew Jernberg. Uh, he and I discuss at length uh, the philosophy of death. Uh, it's an interesting topic. I really love talking to him. I have to apologize to him um, through various comedy of errors. It took a while to get this episode out. Uh, at first, we um, were recording and everything was going flawlessly. And then uh, there was a rather severe storm at his end. Took us a few weeks to get back together to finish the episode, and it's taken me a few weeks more to edit it and put it together. But I'm very happy to release this episode with uh, Matthew, and um, hope to have him back on again someday. So I hope you enjoy. All right, welcome to the Argue With Me podcast. Um, I have with me today Matthew Jernberg, who is uh, ABD grad student with Florida State who's working on the philosophy of death. Uh, he has a podcast called Mortality Matters, and I've listened to uh, to some of it. We'll be talking about uh, the contents of that podcast. I'm sure a little bit today will overlap, but thank you for being here. Oh, thank you very much. Pleased to be here. Right. So philosophy of death. I, I have to ask you, I, I know we didn't discuss this beforehand, but why did you land on that? I mean, you got to expect everybody's going to want to know how do you land on philosophy of death? Yeah, of course. So especially uh, for me, it wasn't, it was an acquired interest that I've only acquired a few years ago, but um, I initially uh, my writing sample and my expressed interest initially to come to study at Florida state uh, was uh, on meta ethics with David McNaughton, but uh he uh, retired, I think, after the first year I was there, and I uh, my interests shifted um, initially to the topic of well-being, or what does it mean for life to go well, or what makes life, what is the good life, the, those kinds of big questions, and um, a special problem in that. I was doing my preliminary exam for the PhD, and one of the papers I wrote was uh, specifically on the topic of um, of why is death bad for you? And it is kind of a particularly uh, difficult problem. And I was reading um, Ben Bradley's Well-Being and Death and was tremendously dissatisfied with his uh, response to this, this problem. And I subsequently looked up other authors working in that literature and None of it really seemed to be satisfying, at least to me. I'm, although the quality of the work was really good, the um, it, it just goes to show the the difficulty of the problem. And I think uh, that kind of motivated more interest. I, I mean, at least at a professional level. I mean, personally, uh, I, I also have uh, more of an interest, partly because um, I have uh, certain health issues that only started to develop after a couple of years in grad school. And uh, what ha was happening um, is I would wake up in the middle of the night with a bit of oxygen panic that was caused by um, having a, uh, um, a problem. I have a sleep apnea, mm -hmm. but I also have, as I also have asthma. And uh, whenever the CPAP machine would get a little dirty or something, like it needed to be cleaned more frequently than what I was doing, um, that would cause a sleep disruption. And I would wake up kind of like elevated heart rate, bit of, you know, panic thinking I'm dying. And, uh, then that made me start thinking, well, would, would it really be so bad if I just didn't wake up tomorrow, uh, for me, you know, uh, I certainly wouldn't be there to experience it. It would just, I would now, go to sleep. And, and you mean that and like, I just wouldn't wake up just in a, in a rational way, you started considering that, uh, more so than in a, uh, you know, I really wouldn't mind if I didn't wake up tomorrow type of... Uh... No, I'm not suicidal. No. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, but just, I mean, just it, it, given given you have these this, this issue, these health issues, it definitely, um, or it, it should at least make you think, you know. Yeah, well, so I, I'm not going to, I don't want to get into uh, the details of, of this on my side either, but I actually suffered uh, about a little more than 10 years ago now, about 10 years ago, um, a life-threatening illness. I'm fine, uh, so uh, there's no need for That's good. anybody watching to to worry about that. But um, yeah, I I had a lot of uh, for sure. It makes you 
think about your own mortality. What what do you want out of life? Um, I didn't so much contemplate would death be bad for me, although that's certainly an interesting question that we're going to talk about today. But it motivated me, I have to say, to hurry up and do a, a lot of things that uh, I thought of doing and just hadn't gotten around to. Um, so maybe that's, uh, you know, uh, that's that's a natural transition, actually, then to the first question I wanted to ask you, which is like, what is what is death anyway? How would a philosopher define that? Well, there's a couple of I mean, just to kind of play with the question a little bit, there's a couple of variants of how that question could be posed. One is more or less asking for a diagnostic criteria for healthcare providers to assess uh, the conditions in which you can uh, officially declare someone dead or um, and that's relevant for organ donation. Uh, so for instance, in many states, uh, they require having a dead donor, uh, which can be problematic. So one of the people I'm, uh, who's the external on my committee, for instance, uh, works on on that topic. Um, sorry, I have my, his name escapes me at the moment. Um, but um, regardless, um, that is a different question. That's it's an operationalized question. It's a question of I mean, practically relevant for medicine. But I think we can just kind of address the question on its own merits and think about well, when we say someone dies, like what are we what do we mean when we describe someone as dead or or having died? And um, there's at least two different things. I mean, I think what happens when most people talk about death or think about death, they they kind of equivocate between these two things, but. Uh, for people who are religious, they think of death as a transition to an afterlife. Or alternatively, if you're a reincarnationist, perhaps you think uh, there's no heaven or hell or anything, but you just get reincarnated into a different form. Um, but alternatively, a more secular view is to think that you know there's no heaven or hell, there's no reincarnation, um, you simply cease to exist. And what it's like to die is an experiential blank. It's like pulling the plug on a computer and then the computer goes out. And um, if you have, so I'm I'm sympathetic with the secular view, right? I, I'm not a religious person and uh, I've um, come to be persuaded that there's no, that death is not a transition to anything other, not even to a corpse because um, in order for there to be a transition, you must persist through the change that you're transitioning into. So like a like a butterfly uh, may, or let me put it another way, a caterpillar may transition into a butterfly through metamorphosis, but that is not, um, that, that requires one and the same thing to persist through that radical transformation. Whereas death is, differs from in almost anything because well, actually uh, it's unique in this regard that um, upon death, the, the subject of the change ceases to exist. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I um, was thinking about this because I knew this was was coming. This um, this discussion. You mean death. Well, every everyone dies. Uh, yeah, I try <laughs> to not think about that. Unlike most, most people, do avoid yeah. the topic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the um, so you know, I was I, I'm a fairly hard minded materialist um, in in the philosophical sense uh, a monist you know this is all we get i'm not a dualist i'm not religious i all due respect to people who are i know there are all kinds of arguments you can make for these different things so i started thinking about like how would i define death and i was having a really surprisingly hard time um you know we all sort of intuitively know what we mean when we're talking to each other about oh he died she died but if i had to put like my finger right on it um, I was having a hard time because it, it can't be just um, like I am right now not really the same as I was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, I, right. Like that version of me isn't here. And a lot of times um, our own experience of, of the world is not as um uh, linear and and um, uninterrupted as we think like there are all kinds of psychological studies where people are given pagers you know and you're, you're paged and people will, and, and the guy will ask you 
what were you just thinking about? And people start to realize, oh, I wasn't thinking about anything at all, <laughs> right? Like before that pager went off. So I started thinking like, you know, okay, it, it can't just be the cessation of consciousness because that can happen to people who we would still consider intuitively alive, right? Like a coma patient, or even you're just not thinking, or you're not noticing, or... Everyone you know, goes to sleep, and they're at least once a night, you have a dreamless component of your sleep. Right, yeah. So you're just kind of like a machine sitting, like lying there, doing not much thinking at all, but your heart's beating, you've got vital signs. But you can have no vital signs and still be kind of alive for a little bit, right? <laughs> if, if you want to consider consciousness. So like... This is a, a, a sneaky question, right? What... Well, I think there's a related topic. There's an issue in metaphysics um, concerning the personal identity. Sure. And I think you might be alluding to that when you mentioned how you're quite different 20 years ago. And um, there's a, a, a big problem in metaphysics as to how things can change, but yet still remain the same thing. Um, sure. This is a little different because... If so, we, well, I'm presuming for the moment that death does annihilate its subject, that the one who dies ceases to exist in virtue of uh, the death. Um, that is itself disputed, um, even among secular people, that is disputed. But of course, in philosophy, almost everything is disputed. But uh, still, um, I think it's the most plausible view of the alternatives. Um, nevertheless, I, I think we you know, if, if we have to kind of solve the problem of personal identity before solving the problem of, of what death is, I'm not sure we're ever going to get to the latter. We'll just be mired in the former. <laughs> so well, I think uh, yeah. whatever, whatever it is, the case, whatever it is that grounds our identity, um, whatever it is that ensures that one and the same person can persist through different changes in its qualities or properties, whatever the answer to that question is, there's a secondary question as to um, what what does it mean to die or what is death? And um, I think, at least I hope that we have a suitably general answer so that if you have a, a theory of personal identity, you can just plug it in. And then you could have a theory of what death is and plug that in. And then they would roughly correspond. I mean, notice it's not, they're not entirely compatible. I mean, if you believe in the soul and if you're religious and you think that uh, death is a transition to some sort of afterlife, um, well, whatever the soul is that pairs your self with your body, um, it would simply become uncoupled. And uh, that, that's what death would consist in. Uh, but under my view, I think if even if that were true, even if we had souls, and there was an afterlife to go to. In that world, it, it would seem rather that no one dies in the sense that um, there never comes a time at which you cease to exist, right? The whole point of positing the soul is um, that the, I think a lot of the motivation behind it is its immortality, that the soul is eternal and uh, indestructible. Uh, yeah. So that's part of the whole motivation behind why people, I think, believe that we have souls. Uh, I actually had a, a friend of mine who was a graduate student at Florida State, who uh, Bob Bishop, who once said to me that he um, found it inconceivable that we could ever cease to exist. Um, partly because he not only believes that there's a soul, he thinks that given the nature of the soul, it would be impossible for it to cease to exist. It's inconceivable. That's uh, that's 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 interesting. I I think I can conceive of it. <laughs> honestly, I have well, to honestly, say. I, di I disagree. I disagree with them. Of course, not only yeah. can we conceive of it, I think it it happens every day. I mean, it's yeah. not. Well, so yeah, like just to back up. I mean, yeah, yeah granted, I, I I'm not going to solve uh, in any uh, part of this podcast any uh, longstanding questions about um, identity in 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 uh, philosophy. However, just from like from my, I guess what I was expressing was from my sort of physicalist point of view. Problems like the ship of Theseus, you know, how many boards do you change before it's not the same ship? Go away with sufficient precision, right? I mean, if you tracked every particle of what you initially deemed to be the ship of Theseus, you'd still find that particle somewhere in the universe, 
or the, in some state. It might not be in the same system that you originally called the ship of Theseus, but it, it will be somewhere. We have conservation laws that we've never seen violated. And so like the system I'm calling myself right now is going to be everything that's there is going to be somewhere, even after we would say I'm dead. Right. <laughs> so if, if, but if I'm calling, like if I'm making this distinction of like the system that I'm calling myself right now is what is alive at the moment, then like a sufficient change in that system, even where there is something that's conscious might mean that a former version of that system is dead. Right. Like, oh, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know if yeah. there's a, a, this is what I'm saying. It's like a hard line. At some point you just sort of have to be practical about it and go, all right, I think he's dead. <laughs> well, I mean, this, the question of personal identity or just the persistence conditions of any material object like the ship of Theseus yeah. um, is, I think, ultimately what, what, what's at heart to that debate is figuring out what objects are, what ordinary objects are, um, and not so much uh, whether any particular paradox can be solved. It's a question of like, you know, how, how, how are we conceptually mapping lines around uh, the simples and the configurations of of simple objects. Those are say partless, um, uh, partless objects that compose everything else, such that this is a a wheel or that's a chair, right? And and so on. And of course, once at that level of of macroscopic objects, when you talk about wheels, I mean, if you simply scatter the parts in relevant ways so that it no longer rolls, I think it's reasonable to say that the wheel doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, so to me, like, I started thinking about that too, uh, about this question, and, and like, maybe a pragmatic answer is sort of the way to go with death. It's like um, everything still exists about this person somewhere, but they no longer form the function of a person, <laughs> right? Like, uh, just like the wheel. So I don't know if that would be uh, the best way to define death. I've been thinking about this for all of a week, so. <laughs> <laughs> that might be that might not be a good answer there might be somebody that is already complaining about the pragmatic view of death but uh well i think we it, can have a suitably neutral answer that doesn't that could stay neutral on the thorny issue of metaphysical persistence and, sure. and just say what whatever it whatever it takes for um for something to exist at a time or through time whatever that is for a person to exist through time um at, at the point at which that person ceases to exist that's when they die. And I don't have to know uh, exactly what the persistence conditions of people are to answer that, whatever they are. When the person ceases to exist, that's when they die. That's the only time they die. And uh, then we still have debates as to whether death must be permanent or whether people can die temporarily. Is resurrection possible? Um, or, you know, other types of, uh, is death a biological notion? Um, are there, is there a, is there a third condition of suspended animation where you could be dead or you can be alive or you can be in some third state and, and so on. So, so, so what do you think? Is death permanent? I don't think so. No, uh, at least not necessarily. I think for, you know, all practical purposes, it is for all of us, but, uh, you know, if there was some magical technology in the future that could reconfigure the atoms in thus and so ways so as to you know resurrect people i, I i'm tempted to say that it's one and the same person who comes back instead of um a clone or a duplicate of some kind that's a new person so yeah i mean okay so if um you you, you uh, a point carré recurrence you've, you've heard the term before or uh it, it's okay if not no, i'm sure I'm, I'm familiar with the yeah. with the mathematician but yeah so same guy and uh the idea is just that the universe can only exist in so many physical states and after a certain amount of time it will repeat the same physical states it's uh, you can get an intuition for this with like a deck of cards can only be arranged so many ways and then if you randomly shuffle it eventually you're going to get back to the initial state of the deck of cards right mm -hmm. and i i've i've thought about this sometimes uh, about this was years ago i was thinking about it but it was like okay i might die and then to my perception 
<laughs> well, I mean, nothing. But then, like, all of this just might happen again. And I would never perceive anything in the middle of it. <laughs> I, might be, I might eventually be the exact same person in some sense if if the universe is conserved and we have just this shuffling of particles so like would that i know this is this is i'm throwing this on you but it's just an intuition i'm asking for i won't hold you to this would that be would you, so you would you think you'd be dead between like the initial uh, uh condition and then the recurrence of it and then alive again or because yeah. we talked about like personal identity disappearing right so what do you think about well, that yeah oh no i haven't <laughs> i haven't considered actually no i you know come to think of it i think mike humor might have a paper in this area does he? Where he are, yeah i mean i anyway i vaguely remember him having a blog post uh about a similar topic but I, i'm not going to speak uh, for him or about that so but but i yeah. i have thought about similar thoughts but but i i don't want to um I guess, um, you know, say anything that would get me uh, empirically falsified. <laughs> no, no. So maybe yeah. perhaps, perhaps physicists would beg to differ about this. But it's a, the question is, what? well, is this even a, a scientific question or is this a, a conceptual question? Because it, at some point, it's a matter of uh, the semantics of how we describe uh, people. And um, is it reasonable to say that a sort of a reconfiguration that's a um, duplicate sort of an atom for atom duplicate of the person who passed away at some time like I don't know, julius caesar or whomever yeah. um, is is that the same person or not i mean that's i don't think that's a scientific question anymore i think that it's a conceptual it, question i agree actually and uh, i'm sorry i want to let you finish the thought but i i originally that's got right. this from leonard suskind a, a, a physicist who was talking about the poincare recurrence um, now I have to find out what Mike said about it. I'm super interested, but uh, I agree. It's not a question of physics. Like the physics are what they are. And then I, I guess what I'm wondering is like, you know, you're, you indicate you're not religious. You don't believe in a soul, but you think death is uh, potentially impermanent. Maybe this is a way that that could fit that category. I, I think that'd be great. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I may be non-religious, but I, I wish in some ways there was a heaven or a God, uh, yeah. partly because I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I don't think there is. But if that is uh, not just physically possible, but that's what actually happens sometime in the distant future, great. But I'm not sure it would bring consolation. I mean, I, I think um, according to my kind of view of the harm of death, um, you would still have reason to fear your own death right now. And I just, uh, I think you asked a question earlier about uh, the missing time. Well, for me, it's a very simple question to answer is, do you exist at that time? If not, then you, then you're, uh, if you had existed in the past, then you are now dead. So I don't think I was dead in 1981 and I was born in 1983. Um, however, perhaps uh, let's suppose for the moment that I die in 2050, um, then in 2051, I will be dead. And then if say in 3050, there's super scientific technology, which resurrects me of some kind and I uh, come back then, and it, and it is me and not just a duplicate of me, then I would have been dead for the intervening period. Um, I think I, I mentioned, um, it's not so much for, for full fledged people that I think this is really puzzling right now because we're we'd have to posit super scientific technology of the far future but uh this is puzzling with regards to um in vitro fertilization and um frozen embryos um which are um frequently discarded um if um if if not used and so there's a there's a question as to when our does the embryo die at the discarding? Does it die when it's frozen? Um, so there are there are some practical implications uh, in the here and now. But uh, incidentally, uh, I'm actually not pro-life, but uh, to some extent, I, I try to be neutral on that topic. I, I, I When I looked at an interesting, there are interesting articles where the philosophy of death impinges on the abortion debate or it impinges I can see that. The word. It has implications for the abortion debate, which is, I think, really interesting. Um, and I think on a 
the most popular view of the harm of death presently, of, of course, you know, through for the entirety of our conversation, we've mainly just been discussing the metaphysics of death, but there's the um, there's the evaluative elements of whether death is bad for you or not. And, and the most popular view of mortal harm is called deprivationism, in which um, your harm, what what makes death harm the one who dies is missing out on the goods of life. Uh, that is to say, for any given death, if, if that person had not died at that time, then they might have lived a net, you know, net positive life otherwise. And if so, then that, that's how harmful the death was. Well, on that view, on a naive uh, version of that view, then the worst time to die is the first moment of your existence. And so under a naive version of that view, abortion is worse than infanticide. And infanticide is worse, all else being equal, abortion uh, is worse than infanticide, and infanticide is worse than um, killing a young man, which is worse than uh, than committing homicide against the elderly or euthanizing I was gonna people say, after age 65. All of a sudden, uh, grandma is just worthless under this... Uh... Anyway, <laughs> right, well, but but that's why the so the people who tend to advocate. So I'm thinking of like uh, Jeff McMahon or others that they tend to complicate their theory of what mortal harm consists in. I think partly <laughs> to uh, they they're reconfiguring their view of mortal harm. I I, I don't know what what this philosopher this is a very prominent philosopher so i don't know what his motivations are but but i it, it fits very nicely i don't want to put it this way when um if if um or maybe i should put it like this so so reconfiguring um one's view of mortal harm has implications on the abortion debate as well as the debate on euthanasia and so what i've seen is different theories tend to complicate their theory of mortal harm so that they can still be pro choice Right. Uh, with regards to abortion, or that they don't uh, want to have their theories uh, well, oh. include that euthanizing the elderly is is not so bad. Sorry, this might be a spot where I'm going to have to edit. <laughs> Can you hear the dog behind me? No. Oh, perfect. There's, Never mind. There's a dog? No, nothing's happening. Yeah, my St. Bernard's barking at something. Um, but nothing's happening, I assure you. So okay. I, I actually wanted to, sorry, the uh, what you were just telling me about how people complicate um, their theories and leaving aside like, uh, you know, uh, theorizing about any individual's motivations, which we, of course, might get I wrong. have no idea. I don't want yeah. to say that. Yeah. No, I, but, I know. But exactly. In general, yeah. the, it's uh, his theory in particular is, is a pretty straightforward application of of um, of uh, prior theorists. Um, um, yeah, no. Anyway, sorry, I'm sorry a, to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Yeah, that, well, that's that's just what I was saying. Is like I don't think either one of us wants to, to uh, uh, or intend to. Derek Parfit's view. Uh, oh, Parfit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, like so, I I don't certainly I don't have anybody in mind here with what I'm about to say. Um, it's just that it did seem to me when I was reading about the harms of death, I was thinking, um, okay, so we've got this idea where the reason death is bad for us is because we can't whatever finish our projects that we want to do or in some way we're barred from completing uh, that book we always wanted to write or whatever it is but uh there seems to be this like view and and here i think i'm talking about is it fisher uh, uh john fisher the the wrote um uh what's the name of it there you go thank you john john martin fisher was one yeah. of the greatest uh authors working in uh, this topic. Uh, he has this wonderful introductory book called Death, Immortality, and Meaning in Life. So I devoted the first 12 episodes of my podcast to uh, as com as monologue commentaries on on that book, uh, right. about one per chapter. Right. So this this is this is why I guess I was thinking about it because I did listen to to your your podcast. I didn't read his book. I was just oh, no. thinking about <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Well, I, I'm not saying I won't read his book. I did look up some uh, book reviews of it. I I have to get. I have a limited amount of time, and I need to you know sure. get brush up on some of it. So, th but there seems to be this like unequal treatment of time before you were alive, and I think you just sort of expressed it too a few minutes ago. And I I don't quite understand that. Like that seems to me sort of uh, like a distinction without a difference. I mean, 
if it, if it's the case that you're going to be alive and you could have gotten started sooner, um, then it seems to me like prior to existing is also kind of a harm. Or if one's bad, the other probably should be bad too. But uh, what do you what do you think about that? Uh, well, I think you're alluding to the asymmetry problem, where um, I mean, so this is. Um, was usually attributed to Lucretius, who was an Epicurean Roman philosopher about 2,000 years ago. And he um, he had these um, poems, actually, but it, incidentally, sorry, it's raining really heavily. Can you hear the rain? Just like you can't hear my dog, I can't hear the rain. So. Oh, wonderful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, typically these are used as arguments for why death doesn't harm you and, and and as such you have no reason to be afraid of death um so epicureans uh like lucretius will um uh, or have argued that um i mean so to, to put it one way uh we don't feel so bad or we're not uh regretful that we didn't live earlier and the, you know the universe went on just fine for quite a long time before we existed. So, you know, after we cease to exist, the universe will go on uh, in a similar fashion. And um, we have no similar, similarly, we have no reason to be afraid of our own death because uh, we already missed out on quite a lot. And we're going to miss out on quite a lot more. I mean, I'm kind of butchering the argument a little bit. I, I do it a, a little bit more justice in my uh, podcast episode. Incidentally, this is one of the points of criticism I have for Fisher, because I feel like there's a, at least four or five different versions of the asymmetry argument, which all conclude that death is harmless. Um, however, or that we have, and incidentally, we have no reason to fear death, uh, that fear of death is irrational. Um, however, um, Fisher really only addresses one version and he doesn't quite put it the way, the right way. So what I do in my podcast is I kind of, and I'm, I'm messing it up now, but in the podcast, no, I, I, I articulate several versions. So I argue that it's actually a um, argument from analogy that there's um, it's a question of what the fitting attitude is regarding one's own death and uh, indifference uh, is the fitting attitude towards uh, all of the, um, all of the time that occurred before we were, before we came into existence, and so one way to re one way to reject that argument is to say, uh, no, we should prefer to have been born earlier. Uh, that uh, it, it is uh, not only uh, good but actually required, perhaps that uh, we regret or maybe not regret, but we um, wish that we had been that we didn't miss the '60s or <laughs> right, yeah. That uh, that where you can put it, you run along deprivationist lines. You could say, but you know, it would have been better for us to had not missed out on all of those good things that happened in the past. And the only relevant temporal asymmetry between past and future is that you know the Middle Ages were quite horrific to live in, <laughs> and right. perhaps that's a reason not to prefer to live there or be alive at that time. But you know, and uh, but overall, there's no um, necessary asymmetry built into the structure of time or into the nature of our own existence uh, that all us being equal uh, we should prefer not only to live longer but also to have to live longer in both directions that we should prefer to uh, have more, more longevity into the future but also you know were it possible to wave a magic wand and to have been born earlier we we should use that magic wand and not be indifferent to the magic yeah. wand yeah to me exactly like th this is what i was getting at is it seems strange to see um well to me it's all or nothing either lucretius i guess is right that hey you weren't bothered before so you shouldn't be bothered after or if you're going to be bothered that you're missing a bunch of stuff after you should be bothered that you missed a bunch of stuff before and i i can't understand how some people will segment this uh, as if there's a difference but it seems like people do. <laughs> um, well, there's a couple of ways. I mean, Fisher outlines that in his book, and he, I think, does a good job summarizing the literature as well. So one approach is to say, um, you know, it's possible to live longer, but it's not possible to be born earlier. So what you would be wishing for is an impossibility. 
And it's not rational to wish for impossibilities. Yeah. So like I have some um, sympathy with that from like a stoic point of view, in, in which case it's like it's just a waste of time to to, you know, burden yourself thinking about something you can't change. That makes sense. But it seems to me like as long as we're wishing for the impossible in either direction, because certainly it is impossible in, in long. Like if you pick some timeline, it's impossible in both directions. Um, well, the, the Seneca, I mean, it's an open question, I think, is or at least uh, I'm not sure that there's only one possible future. Um, so I'm I'm. Uh, do we have the requisite kind of control over our own actions such that we can do otherwise? Um, or is that not the case? Uh, I'm not entirely sure about that. I, I don't know. I, I spent a couple of years taking seminars on free will yeah. and I do not have a settled view uh, on the matter. Uh, of course that, you know, I, uh, Fisher also is published notably on free will and he's compatibilist. So the ability to otherwise on his view is not required for us to have free will that even if there is only one possible future, we still have free will. And uh, it has to do with the re certain kinds of control capacities that are rational sure, and are, whether yeah. reasons responsive. Right. I, well, I mean, I, I can, I, I don't mind telling you, I mean, I'm a determinist and I'm not a compatibilist, but I don't think it affects, I guess my sort of my claim anyway, which is that like, yeah, it might be uh, not, sensible to worry about something you can't change but um like you could extend your life but not indefinitely it's just like we have no reason to think it's possible to it's just as impossible based on what we know about physics to right. to extend your life indefinitely as it is to go back in time so i'm not sure that i accept that argument that it makes one tale of things more important than the other that sort of thing, right? Like, uh, well, there might be different it, kinds of possibility, right? So, um, it may be contrary to the laws of nature to have indefinite life extension, but uh, the argument would go that it's not only uh, impossible under the current laws of nature for you to be born earlier, but under any other possible laws of nature, any other set of laws of nature, it would also be impossible to be born earlier because the degree of uh, modal strength is much greater. It's a conceptual impossibility uh, or a metaphysical impossibility, perhaps because your origins are essential to you or for some other reason having to do with possible worlds. But um, you know, I, I think uh, I'm not tempted or sympathetic with this line. I mean, I'm more or less uh, arguing on behalf of yeah, I understand. Um, yeah. Those who take this approach. And Fisher yeah. doesn't agree with that either. I mean, this is um, the one frustration I have with that approach is it doesn't explain like if what if you're going to identify a relevant asymmetry between the past and the future such that it is rational to um, be indifferent about the past, but it's it, it's um, not rational to be indifferent about the future, then the um, your explanation should try to ground that, the, the, the rationality of, of those hopes or desires. And uh, if it is just saying, well, it's an impossibility, so it's not worth thinking about, or maybe that's the wrong way to put it, but, but you know, just dealing with the, the, the modal metaphysics of the matter, on you know what are the possibility conditions? It doesn't explain uh, what it's rational to hope for or what it's rational to uh, desire regarding our own longevity. And I think that's what's dissatisfying about that approach is it, it's a purely uh, non-normative discussion. It, it's just thinking about the possibility conditions and um, not yeah. really thinking about. Uh, why it's it's rational to uh, to fear death? Yeah, it's, it's, it seems it seems like there's life. It's, it seems like there's a um, uh, almost a Mott and Bailey happening where it's like, hey, what uh, what what would you like if uh, you could have it? And then it's like, hey, this is what I would like. And then it's like, oh well, you can't have that, so it doesn't make sense to, you know, you could interchange those two viewpoints at any point in the in the analysis to make it come out one way or the other. 
<laughs> to... Right. Uh, well, but actually, I should quibble a little bit with the Stoic view. So I flirted with Stoicism a few years ago, but I find it uh, mistaken about the metaphysics and vicious about the ethics. Like, I, I don't think it's a good view to hold. No. Um, no. I, I'm happy. To, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to have the digression if you want to tell me about Stoicism, and why you well, don't like it. So, I think that. I mean, I'm not addressing the like the popular conceptions. I, I have a I have a friend of mine who's a, another colleague uh, or a fellow graduate student at uh, Florida State University who is a committed Stoic, and he's writing his dissertation on. Uh, what meaning in life consists in from a stoic perspective. Sure. And um, I think that's an interesting project, but um, I tend to think that stoic, stoicism tends to have an overly internalized view of virtue. Uh, and it's very extreme. I mean, the notion that the only thing good is virtue and that uh, one cannot be immiserated if sufficiently virtuous. I, I find that to be deeply implausible. Uh, so, so like um, Epictetus in the uh, in Chiriadon has a um, kind of famous line about uh, being tortured, and in some sense that was the most liberating moment of his life. Um, and in fact, I, I mean, I find that to be psychologically unrealistic, um, and also not. I I think there's a kind of um, no matter how good we are as people there's um, things that can happen to us which immiserates us beyond our control. And further, the emphasis on control that Stoicism send, tends to have um, has this strange consequence that the only one who can harm you is you, uh, at least directly. No, any, the way anyone else harms you is indirectly. Uh, they harm you in, by... Uh, creating conditions such that you harm yourself, um, th because the only bad, only thing bad is vice, right? The only thing good is virtue, and so how can you be harmed? Well, the only way to be harmed is to be vicious, is to have a negative attitude or uh, a negative response or reaction to uh, misfortune, and I find that to be radically implausible. Yeah. I think <laughs> torturing people harms them. <laughs> Too much. Sure. Sure. I, I, the, yeah, the interesting, so stoicism, I, I don't have a, a set opinion about it, but something that I always thought was like, stoicism is practically useful. So it's almost like from a utilitarian perspective can be really useful, but that doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> like from, from the stoic viewpoint, <laughs> it, it might be more true from a pragmatic viewpoint than true from a stoic viewpoint because like if you have no choice but to go through a whole lot of really awful stuff it might be really helpful to think um this is just happening to me i can be better than this i don't have to react that way use your reason you know reason is virtue like all of that stuff might help you right <laughs> so, I, I, yeah it's, but it's the totalizing sure nature of the view that is problematic i think it's overly extreme yeah but, but nevertheless i mean it's it was uh I, I don't know for this for sure, but but if it was a historical influence in the creation of cognitive behavior therapy, I think that's wonderful. And to the extent that people can derive value from reading Ryan Holiday books about bringing control in their lives, I mean, this is great, yeah. you know, or reconciling themselves with things outside of their control. But um, the, the, the Seneca is a beautiful writer. Uh, I love Seneca's writing. Uh, but... Uh, um, he also has uh, mistaken views about the harm of death. I think uh, Marcus Aurelius is another beautiful writer that um, has uh, says false things. About it, well, so to get to get back to to death, and I want to I want to move on to meaning, but I have one more thing I really want to ask you about. That we may uh, have to table meaning for uh, for another, another time. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah, it might be. Actually, I would love that to have you back to talk about it. Maybe. Um, so, so death, um, death being bad in particular. Uh, I thought about this while you were uh, explaining something. I don't remember what it was now, but antinatalism, right? This idea that you'd be better off to never have been born. Um, I know that the idea, antinatalists will often say, well, I'm not saying you should go kill yourself. Um, I'm just saying that you would have been better off if you were never born. And sometimes I think they just say that because they don't want to be responsible for somebody killing themselves. 
But in any case, the, the, the core argument is that basically life is more unpleasant than it is pleasant. And more of human existence is suffering than not suffering. So like on the whole, when you do the math, you would have been better off to have not been born. And then if that's the case, I wonder how, like, we don't have to grant that, of course. That's just what I think the, the, the base argument is. Like, I, I think an antinatalist might disagree then about death being bad, right? <laughs> like, uh, it's... Uh, have, have you ever run into antinatalism or you're... Yeah, I've... Um, I have to say that I'm understudied on the subject. Um, it is a topic that is... Um, relevantly close to what I work on that, you know, someday I should engage more with that literature. I, I mean, I've read Benatar's initial essay from the nineties and I've read selections of his book better uh, not to have been, I think, or yeah, something like that yeah. titles, something like, maybe I got the title wrong, but it's in that ballpark. Um, it's been about five years. So I'm a little fuzzy on the details, but uh, the biggest, the, one of the things, I mean, I included it when I taught intro to philosophy and one of the things I struggled with when when teaching the material was trying to reformulate. First of all, uh, the initial argument is put in terms of pleasure and pain, which presumes hedonism about goodness. And if you think hedonism is false for other reasons, then how can you have a, a suitably non-hedonistic articulation? Well, that's actually not that difficult. You just replace pleasure with good, whatever good is, and pain with with bad, whatever the nature of bad is, without you know being suitably neutral on on which value theory turns out to be the true one. Um, so I, that wasn't that difficult to do, to re, uh, articulate his core argument without a commitment to hedonism. Uh, the bigger problem was re-articulating the argument without a commitment to my onionism about non-existent objects. So better for who? So it, you, the way, even the way you stated, although I'm not sure it was correctly stated, uh, I think it wasn't, but, but that's all right. I mean, if we were to go look at the material carefully, I think it is difficult. I don't think it's it's just your mistake. I think there's a there's something conceptually incoherent uh, at the core of antinatalism, where you have to ask yourself: better for who? The being who doesn't exist yet. Uh, who is it better for not to come into existence? Uh, there is no such person. They don't exist. That's kind of the point. Uh, and then after the fact, sort of ex post facto you already exist and he's not advocating for suicide. So that's a moot point. Uh, uh, but so the question is more or less for, you know, prospective parents. I mean, should you uh, uh, not have a child or not? Uh, and, and I think what further clouds the, or muddies the waters is uh, a frequent commitment to environmentalism. Um, that is, I think, motivating a lot of the subscribers, although I'm not, uh, you know, that does happen. Yeah. So I had, a, I had a fellow graduate student who uh, was a committed antinatalist for environmental reasons. And he uh, thought that uh, the worst thing you can do is have a child uh, for reasons uh, having to do with the environment. And But the argument that Benatar gives is nothing to do with environmentalism. It's independent. No. Uh, it, it could very well be that we could live in a different planet. I suppose we lived in a planet with 10 times the natural resources, 100 times the natural resources. Uh, such that it would be economically and ecologically sustainable to continue to have children. We shouldn't even have that. It doesn't, it's, his argument is independent of, of the environment. So uh, I think um, I would need to study the argument more. I, so the, my view of the matter is we need to re-articulate the argument without the problematic commitments and see if it still is even conceptually coherent. And I think if it can be re-articulated, it's interesting. But my, my general uh, concern is you know, how can we re-articulate the argument without a commitment to non-existent people? Well, so he, you know? I, like, I think this really might might be affected by sort of what your your research is or what you, what you think about. Because, like, if I remember correctly, and I'm sure I didn't, didn't uh, exactly say the formula he uses to get to, hey, you'd be better off if you weren't born. But I'm pretty sure I was pretty close. And I remember reading a table that, that is either in his book or an essay or, or something wasn't something Benatar did that that said non-existence is basically like neutral right like it's that's not even a, it's not a good or a bad and i think you're telling me like well it's probably bad actually it does it does there is a harm in death and so i'm thinking it will actually whether i articulated it poorly or not it's going to throw his math off if he's wrong about that right like <laughs> well 
Yeah, and I don't want to feign too much ignorance here. So, so he does have a relevant asymmetry between the absence of a good and the presence of a bad, yeah. which I find suspect as well. But regardless, uh, even if we grant um, certain asymmetries between um, the the absence of a good and the presence of a bad, uh, I think um, I'm not I'm not sure his argument is coherent. At the end of the day, I'm not sure the view is coherent. Um, I mean, so uh, just to address the the substance of what you said, though, that um so i don't think that on my view of the harm of death so th there's three possible or there's more than that but but in broad strokes you know does death harm you yes or no if no the best explanation for that in my view is epicureanism um if uh yes if death does harm the one who dies then uh in what does the harm consist it either consists in the absence of a possible good which is deprivationism, or it consists in the presence of an actual bad, which is my view, I call it destructivism. Um, it was inspired by um, uh, problems associated with Bernard Williams' uh, view. Uh, Bernard Williams in the Macropolis case talks about how death is, gives meaning to our lives and how um, there are certain kinds of desires, which uh, the frustration of which is what makes that death bad for us. And um, I, what I like about Epicureanism and what I like about Bernard Williams' uh, desire view is its emphasis on what is actually the case. Uh, it's not a question of what what should have could have happened. It uh, what what actually makes actual deaths harm actual people is what actually happens. Uh, it, it's not a so so uh, this is why like certain authors uh, will sometimes describe deprivationist view as a comparative view. Uh, so what 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 makes death harm the one who dies is uh is based on a comparison between how your life actually goes and the nearest possible world at which you do not die at that time and the difference um if it's positive uh it, it the, the, a positive difference between your actual life and the life you would have had if you didn't die is what makes it harmful and if it was a negative difference then it your death would actually be good for you. So if you imagine the end of life care scenario where right. um, somebody pulls the plug instead of letting this person's linger and suffer for another week of constant agony, um, the comparative difference between those two possible ends of life uh, is, would be negative in that case. And so the death would be good, all things considered. Um, so that's why it's very popular, I think. Uh, deprivationism, I think, is the dominant view in the literature because it gives this kind of um, intuitive answers on end of life case scenarios, but then it gets into trouble when it comes to the topic of abortion. And I think it's a bit embarrassed by um, by that topic. Um, and I actually have, I think, a, a, a more natural view where it's based on loss. Uh, I think what um, what makes death the harm what what makes death harm the one who dies is loss of well being at a time. And um, it's not a comparison between uh, the life you actually lead and, and the nearby possible life where you could have uh, had a different life or a different death. Uh, rather, it's it's um, based on what actually happens and only what happens. And um, insofar as you have more to lose, then your death is worse for you. And what makes infanticide worse than abortion is that uh, babies have... Uh, more to lose than clusters of cells. Uh, <laughs> Do you think so? Let me let me ask you uh, the famous words. Let me ask you this. So I sure. like I like what you're saying right now, and and I I was thinking, look, the only the only real problem with death is that we subjectively don't like it, but that's serious to us because we're subjective beings. We have a, an experience that that you know we might not want death just the same way we don't want rain tomorrow or whatever whatever might foul up our plans and what we want and that seems bad enough to me uh and i wonder sometimes i wonder sometimes because I, well, I know this happens in certain other topics of philosophy if things just get overcomplicated for what the just obvious practical truth is which is just like you you said like um look i this is i i'm not going to even uh, express an opinion one way or the other on abortion because for me to do so satisfactorily will take it like two hours for me to explain um, but I can understand why it would be worse to kill a child that apprehends the world and has aspirations and that sort of thing versus a bunch of cells that um, 
you know, I can understand this argument, I guess is what I'm saying, it, versus a bunch of cells that don't apprehend the world and and have no aspirations and that sort of thing. Certainly the subjective harm is worse in one scenario than the other, to say nothing of like any objective story you want to tell, right? I mean, is is that intuition just sort of enough to put the, yeah, death is bad, stamp of approval, like, and it's destructive? Well, what about what about viruses? Yeah. Or what about ants? Right. What about, uh, so on my view, uh, death is bad for ants. Death yeah. is bad for anything that has a good, but may not have a subjective reality, or perhaps has a very dim diminished subjective reality. I mean, there is something it's like to be an ant. Is there something it's like to be a virus? I mean, I'm not sure whether having a well, whether well-being as a concept uh, is coextensive with uh, subjectivity. Um, perhaps it know. is, perhaps it does. I mean, corporations are, are corporations people. I mean, if, you know, they're certainly legal persons, but, uh, if there's things that are good or bad for a corporation, uh, collectively, then it would be bad for the corporation to die. Um, is that a metaphorical use of death? Uh, I don't think so. It doesn't have to be. Uh, so this is why I think death is not a biological concept. I think it's a metaphysical concept having to do with uh, the secession of existence, whatever the existence of something is. And so uh, in my view, uh, if, if, there's, if it's coherent to say that um, an entity of some kind has uh, flourishes or that it, it prospers or that it takes advantage of things or it has it benefits from some scenario. Uh, if if it could benefit, if it's possible for this entity to benefit, then it can it. What makes it cease to exist is bad for that entity, sure. and that's what I would call death. And that's where we started the conversation: is what even is death? And and in it's difficult enough to think about the death of people, let alone the death of a corporation or the death of an ant, the death of a virus. Um, sure, but, but I, I whatever, can see. I can yeah. see like. Um... I guess I guess my framing it as subjective is to avoid the argument of what is bad or good because this this creature that's dying whatever it is wants something that's just a statement of fact it doesn't get it that's just this, there's there's no evaluation of a moral sense going on in here and obviously if it wanted it and it didn't get it it didn't get what it wanted which will from its point of view be bad which is just another statement of fact. <laughs> well, no, no, that, that that last statement is a bit of a jump there. But, well, but I think well, not really. Yeah, I'm not saying I, it actually is bad. I'm saying from the point of view of the thing that wanted it and didn't get it, that's just follows that it's bad for them, right? Like, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I like I said, I'm I'm neutral as to what makes things good or bad. Yeah. Um, ultimately, uh, there's a variety of different views in the literature you know, pick which one you want. It sounds like... Don't you kind of have to tackle that, though, to, to figure this out? I feel like you kind of... That would be a second dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so the first dissertation is just... I, I, I mean, keep in mind, that motivated my project initially was thinking about what makes good things good and bad things bad. Yeah. And uh, I was, at the time, I was sympathetic with... Um, or I flirted with Stoicism, and then I became more sympathetic with Aristotelianism. Um, but uh, even among Aristotelians, there's disagreement between pluralists and monists. So you might think that there's one and only one fundamental property that makes good things good and likewise bad things bad. Or alternatively, you might think there's a plurality of different types of goods. Maybe there's a list of them. Um, and it's not a subjective matter. Uh, you might think this is an objective list. Um, although some of the items on the list might be subjective things like uh, whether people get what they want or whether one gets what they want, but it doesn't it needn't be, you know, reduced to that. I mean, it, but uh, nevertheless, um, th that's a question of well-being. It's a question of what makes good things good and what it means to be well or to live a good life uh, on the whole. And you can kind of focus on a day to day, or you can focus on the life as a whole. Typically, in the literature, people focus on what makes for a good life as a whole because it is because we're human beings. And well, I think a lot of the times uh, people teach nineteen-year-olds, uh, undergraduates, and and so they're kind of at the beginning of their adult life and thinking about what to major in. And 
many of the professors try to persuade them to major in philosophy. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that that's how that'll, the that'll is... show you what's good in life for sure. Majoring in philosophy, that <laughs> uh, it might just depress you too. It depends on. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the philosophy you're reading. Yeah, or, exactly. Or philosophers yeah. teaching you. Yeah, yeah, but I, I get like I guess. Um, I, I mean, so maybe I'm not understanding this destructive, uh, destructivism point of view, but um, loss of goodness. It, you have yeah. more to lose. So I think in I think destructivism is the most intuitive, most common sense view on offer. I mean, it, right. it's just odd that it's not defended at that level of generality in the literature, which is what I'm hoping to do with my dissertation. Well, I guess it's just that when you say loss of goodness, I start to not entirely understand. Like, can can you give me, maybe you could explain by examples of loss of goodness. Well, yeah. So um, you're probably pretty comfortable, I hope. And comfort is good for you. And if your back starts to ache, you have lost your comfort. You've lost something that's good for you. Well, but it's it's good for me in a subjective sense that I like being comfortable, right? Like, but I can see other people arguing like that. That's not really what goodness is. I mean, Stoics are an example. They don't have to be the example, but they are an example, right? I know you don't don't accept Stoicism, and frankly, I don't think I do either. But the the, the point is that um, somebody is going to be like, well, wait a minute, but with with this goodness thing, it seems like we're glossing over that and. I can I can understand your point of view from the subjective, right? Like it's it's just a fact about whether this thing wants that, whether this thing considers it good, and then it doesn't get it, uh, and that's that's going to be bad according to that thing. But well, I'm I guess I'm an objectivist about about goodness, and so, um, you know, you think of it like vision, right? So from your perspective, you have a point of view on the world where. I don't know. If I raise my right arm, does it look to you as if it's my left arm? I'm not sure. Uh, but there's a, an objective fact of the matter as to which arm I'm raising. Sure. And I think of goodness kind of like that. Um, there's an objective fact of the matter about what is or is not uh, good for us. And insofar as we have perceptions or beliefs, uh, they are true in virtue of what is objectively good or bad for us. But but I think that's, you know, that's a contentious statement to make, but I yeah that's... That's what I think is right. But I think um, that's not that crazy when you think it, it depends. So hedonists are objectivist, even though they think ultimately what makes good things good is um, a, a feeling of pleasure. They yeah. uh, There's an objective fact of the matter as to whether one is experiencing pleasure. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, this, this, that's a scientific question, actually. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, in that sense, um, doesn't matter what your attitude is about it, how you, you know, what you think about it, uh, it, it either you do experience the pleasure or you don't. Uh, and you know, the only question is how much pleasure do you feel? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's the objective, I mean, obviously this is the problem they're going to run into though, is like, there's the objective fact that the thing is feeling pleasure. You can, that's in principle discoverable. Um, but then the, there's something being tacked on, which is, and that is good, right? Which is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which that part that's is not, the, that's the evaluative <laughs> part. That's the conceptual non-scientific part of yeah. the question. Right. So like, I can understand, I guess, um, like we all will have preferences, uh, and they're discoverable in principle as well. And even explainable for a lot of reasons, like evolutionarily uh, evolutionary psychology reasons will totally explain why we have preferences and why we wouldn't like death too that <laughs> it makes sense to me why we'd have that wiring um from a game theoretic point of view and like isn't that enough to just say death is bad for that thing like like in that thing's well, view and that's its subjective view because it wants to continue but it won't so it would consider it bad like does it do we have to get into any evaluative thing other than that well i think you're already making an evaluation at that even at that level i, I don't so like, I, I think yeah it's oh, sorry, inescapable 
the value of the value of claims are inescapable. I mean, so if, if an evolutionary psychologist were a part of our conversation now and they were to give uh, an evolutionary explanation as to why biological organisms are aversive to death, um, at most that, that would be interesting, but it would give a causal um, explanation which would identify uh, what made it the case that uh, organisms have these aversions. Uh, it would not even be attempting to answer the evaluative question, uh, but is it bad? Uh, and if so, why? Well, if I think not, it would. I, I mean, I don't know if it wouldn't be attempting to. It, it would just be explaining this thing will think it's bad, right? Like that. that's what the evolutionary psychologist would say. It doesn't mean well, that I, it has to be objectively bad. It just means that well, this, if you ask oh. this thing, right? <laughs> well, I'm not sure a fly could could answer the question. But but that's yeah. a separate side. Yeah. That's a separate question, though, as to whether what it thinks, right? So um, a fly, a, 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 there's a, a fruit fly flying around right now. Yeah. And if I try to swat, swat the fruit fly, it will be averse to being killed. And uh, I'm not sure it has any thoughts. Certainly no self-conscious thoughts. About yeah, well, I, I don't even think I was thinking about consciousness. I, I was just thinking about the thing doesn't doesn't want it. Um, so just yeah, it's a, know, it's aversive. Have, it yeah. it yeah. wants to not die. I think yeah. is that I'm not entirely. I mean, I think human beings have desires. Do fruit flies have desires? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. It depends what we mean by by desire or yeah. want. Uh, perhaps they do. Uh, they definitely engage in aversive behavior. Uh, if you try to swat a fly, it avoids being killed. Um, that's true for almost every biological organism. Um, they tend to avoid what they perceive as mortal threat. And for evolutionary reasons, right? This is what enables the propagation of their species. And this is what made it the case that these animals exist at all instead of some other animals, which are not aversive. Um, th those are interesting causal explanations although to some extent they're a bit um, post hoc, uh, nevertheless, uh, it doesn't, it's not even in attempting to engage in the evaluative question as to, but is it bad? Well, and I guess, I it guess it's, bad? it's not trying to answer that question. It's more like asking if, if it's a category error, error or like, does that even a thing that, that you know what I mean? Like, is it, uh, and, and I guess what I'm saying is like, if you are, if you accept the evolutionary reasons why we don't like it, and you can accept that we can obviously we're not going to disagree that you can make a statement about a person's desires that is based on objective fact you could scan their brain in principle and find out what they want or don't want right hopefully uh, yeah, yeah like that's right and it, it, it could be a, a conscious thing a non-conscious thing if we're just going on scanning neurons to find out what they're doing it doesn't really matter if it's conscious or not and um I guess what I'm saying is like, what evidence is there to then go to make the jump? Like there's an evaluative thing that we have to deal with here. And what, like, why isn't it good enough to just go death is bad because none of us want it for evolutionary reasons, except for some of us who like for other evolutionary reasons don't want to feel pain anymore or something like this. Like, is it, is it not satisfying to say that versus jumping into this evaluative realm of of because i i feel like and i'm going to shut up in two seconds i swear and <laughs> i want to hear what you have to no, say it's fine. It's fine. but i i feel like a, a lot of um like I, I feel like it's almost reinventing the purpose of religion which is like oh boy i've i've starkly realized you know uh that i'm an automaton or that that's what the evidence shows and now i've got to come up with another way though of still rescuing objective morality out of this or, or something i'm not trying to saddle you with that i'm just it, it just feels that way to me when i when i sit here and i think about like how the the universe sort of works so i don't i don't know if the evaluative question is a category error or if, it, if it's even necessary to get into it to say to me death is bad right like um well i mean first off i don't think these considerations are unique or specific to death per se just no yeah anything good and all like uh, cupcakes are cupcakes good for you are they bad for you um it seems like everything you just said could be applicable to cupcakes um <laughs> and anything else true yeah uh i was doing a bad job of explaining um uh, the position maybe but uh 
essentially the there's this idea that uh once you're uh, well we, we referenced the book better never to have been um and uh, the argument that uh being alive is more negative than it is positive in many ways so perhaps there's nothing to fear uh or maybe death would be a good thing um which is not the argument of an antinatalist but this is what sort of have i think how i explained it so you can clear that up and the other thing we left off was uh uh my sort of nihilistic viewpoint that, well, maybe, maybe all we have are preferences and there's no real reason um, to not uh, want to be dead or not want to die other than that. We're just sort of genetically coded the way that way for game theoretic reasons. And that's, that's it. That's why we, why, why think about that any farther? We, we want to live uh, because that's how evolution has sort of formed us. And there's not really a moral, um, uh, or objectively moral viewpoint in this. It's just a subjective preference. Um, Matthew, I'll leave it to you. You can pick. Which one of those two did you want to uh, correct me on first? Well, I guess we could proceed in reverse order. Okay. Because um, it's interesting to try to... I mean, I don't deny that evolved beings like animals, like us, wish to avoid dying. And you know, for the most part. I mean, there are suicidal people who succeed at killing themselves sometimes, but um, that uh, simply doesn't uh, address the topic about whether we should uh, want to avoid death or, or whether death would actually be bad for us. Now, uh, I believe there was something, another component to that, which you said uh, th there is a, it was almost like a, almost like a debunking uh, argument that you seem to be gesturing at, which was that um, be, because of this evolutionary story, uh, that gives us good reason to believe that uh, there is nothing more to um, the harm of death other than our preference to not die. And right. um, well, I mean, I, I don't want to be too uncharitable, but it, it does strike me, at least there's something incomplete with the argument as stated, uh, because otherwise it would be, it, you would worry if it was committing the genetic fallacy, where by referencing the cause or the origin of a desire, one thereby uh, debunks the desire, you know, because this uh, desire to avoid death or this aversion to death um, is evolved that gives us good reason to believe that there's no reason to be averse to death whatsoever. I, and that, I that's guess, a bit of a jump. Uh, I'm guess, sure that maybe there's there's some way to complete the argument, but as stated- Well, I, I won't even try. I'll just tell you what I was thinking really. And- uh, Oh, sure. Was just, was just more so that um, it's evidence that it's a subjective only uh, preference that, that, that uh, you know, like I am built to feel this way doesn't mean that the desire doesn't exist or that, that that's not something that people can take into account. Um, but just that it explains why I'm afraid of death. And I'm not sure that um, uh, that explains why there are no other reasons why I wouldn't want death, but it might be the, <laughs> the only reason. So it's an invitation to, I guess, if you want to rescue uh, the situation. <laughs> well, uh, sure. Well, actually, um, just to uh, address the point on its own terms, um, there, uh, so there, I have certain evolved preferences for sweets or for something salty that um, is merely subjective as a preference, and yet uh, there are good there are good reasons for me to have this preference, right? So. Uh, due to these evolutionary reasons, right? So we evolved in times in which food is very scarce and sweets are very energy dense, uh, calorically dense. And by occasionally indulging in what we perceive as sweet, that actually was objectively good for us in the sense that it increased our, our fitness value as, as, uh, as uh, animals. Uh, it made it more probable that we would survive as a species with this preference than otherwise. Uh, so I, I do want to dispute a little bit of the point that just because something is a subjective preference, then thereby there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't actually be good for us. Uh, I do think it is. Uh, and that's a good analogy as one particular case, though I don't think it's entirely analogous uh, to our aversion to death. I actually do think we have very good reasons to avoid death um, <laughs> uh, other than uh, things that go beyond what is merely subjective. Um, 
And also, I think we should probably unpack what we mean by subjective. Uh, I, I think those are uh, pretty big words. They're, they're kind of these suitcase words where a lot of concepts can fit uh, into a single term. Um, sometimes what people mean when they say um, matters of taste uh, are, or aesthetics uh, or beauty is, is uh, judgments of beauty are subjective. Sometimes they mean it's um, not up to you to decide what is or is not beautiful, or it is up to you to decide what is or is not beautiful if people disagree about whether beauty is subjective or, or not. Um, so this phrase, it's, it, whether it's up to you, uh, is um, synonymous with being something being subjective. Uh, another way of putting it is that it's stance independent or it's independent of any mind uh, such that something is subjective if and only if um, it is mind independent. Uh, so um, I have a, a hairbrush here and you might think, well, this is uh, not, it's not subjective in the sense that there is a fact of the matter that is not dependent on a mind, whether or not there exists a brush. And an idealist would dispute this by saying, no, it, it, um, there's no such thing as a, a mind independent substance or a mind independent object. Uh, we're all ideas in the mind of God or, or something. And in which case this is um, not independent of any mind. This is dependent on the mind of God. Uh, and that's why this is subjective. Right. right. Uh, so it's like a uh, hyper subjectivity of some kind that everything is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in philosophy, people defend all sorts of views. Uh, yeah, so, sure. Sure. Uh, that uh, or that's Bishop Barclay's, uh, the kind of famous uh, modern philosopher. OK. Uh, um, anyway, so uh, that's just one example. Um, now, you might think that um, that's just three ways of disambiguating what it means for some for anything to be subjective. And I think regardless of how you disambiguate what it means for something to be subjective, under any such disambiguation, uh, the harm of death is not subjective. It, it's not dependent on the existence of some mind. I think um, uh, things without, uh, you know, so if something can live without a mind, um, it, it would be bad for that thing to die. So perhaps a corporation, uh, if, if corporate death uh, was something that literally could occur and not just metaphorically, uh, it could very well be the case that a corporation does not have a collective mind, uh, although individuals within that corporation have minds. The corporation itself does not, and yet it would still be bad for the corporation to die. Uh, now, that might be a contentious example, but you might think of like a, a hive, like a hive of bees, uh, as another example of something which uh, arguably could die, and in which case it would be bad for that thing to die, even if it uh, is not mental or has no mind. Um, now you might argue, you know, in reply that, uh, well, it's still, you haven't disputed that it's mind independent. It's just independent of the existence of the mind of the collective entity, but perhaps, uh, the individuals that compose the hive or the individuals that compose the corporation, they, they would be, um, uh, the minds that, for which the harm of death would be bad for, for the corporation to die. You might think that you might think, yeah, okay. If Amazon dies, if that literally makes sense, if that's even possible, then uh, what would make it the case that the death of Amazon would be a bad thing would be, let's say, the Amazon workers or perhaps the consumers, you know, like you wouldn't be able to order anything from Amazon anymore. And it's in virtue of the subjective uh, traits, dispositions, or attitudes of the uh, com constituent individuals that the death of a corporation like Amazon would be bad. And you might think that, but um, I think that is a bit of a, there's something that is something reductive about that move which I think um, is a bit objectionable. Um, but um, I, I think it's not quite locating the harm maker in the right place, right? And in fact, this is kind of a general point I make uh, regarding, uh, of course, I, I'm uh, selfishly guarding all of my, my notes and <laughs> work and only divulging it in podcasts like this. But I think the harm maker, trying to figure out what makes it the case that the death is harmful for the one who dies is uh, one of the slipperiest elements of the entire literature on the philosophy of death. And that's what I'm hoping to uh, help improve uh, with my contribution, if, if I may be so bold, if, if, if it ever gets released. Um, because I think, um, well, I, I'm trying to um, coin a, a new term, um, um, uh, what I'm calling destructivism. So um, if you ask yourself, not if, but how death harms the one who dies, you might think of um, 
all the, if you think of someone you love who died and you might think, well, uh, you, you perhaps you know why it's bad for you that this other person died because of your grief or because of the loss of the other person. Um, but what, how is it possible that it's bad for that person, for the one who died to have died? And you might think, uh, well, it's because they're missing out on all the goods of life uh, that, that had they not died at that time, they would have lived a, a rich and fulfilling life. Or perhaps even if they're at the end of their lives, there's, you know, television shows they could have enjoyed or, you know, uh, warm showers, uh, all sorts of uh, pleasant or, or I think otherwise the, good the, things. The classic example is always, oh, they'll never get to see their grandkid go to whatever university or get married, right? Or whatever, right? right. That's the one you always hear. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's a, a lot of psychological projection going on in those types of stories. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could very well be. Yeah. Well, but uh, I, I doesn't, I don't, I mean to um, uh, debunk them a little bit, but, but I think the, the problem uh, there's numerous problems with that initial impulse, although I think it is, it, it's reasonable to make. I mean, it's a, it's a natural inclination. I have the same inclination. And in fact, it's not just a mere inclination. I think, um, you know, if you're walking down some, uh, train tracks and you hear a train coming, one of the reasons for you to get off the train tracks has to do, among many reasons, uh, has to do with all of the good things you would do or you're planning to do uh, if you were not to die at that time. Um, so I think um, possible deprivations are, you know, provide us with reasons to uh, avoid death, but I don't think that's the whole of the story. I don't think even that that that's even part of what makes it the case that the death at that time is harmful to the one who dies. Um, in fact, um, in this regard, I'm I'm something of, or at least I think what is the case is is I think we should be actualists about the harm makers, uh, because uh, I think where these deprivationist stories go wrong about what makes it the case that the har death is harming the one who dies is identifying the relevant counterfactual. Uh, that's one of many, among many problems. Um, another problem is the timing problem, but um, that is to say, to identify when uh, is when does death harm the one who dies, and uh, that problem, uh, that question does not allow for an obvious answer on any of these alternative views. Uh, the, 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 well, this is what funny I call them alternative, but these are the dominant views in the literature. So the the default view, uh, the most dominant view in the literature, is that uh, death harms the one who dies in virtue of um, the possible goods of life, also known as deprivations. So death deprives, in virtue of the deprivation that death causes, death harms the one who dies. That's the dominant view. And that's my main target. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I, maybe you could just clarify one thing quickly for me on that then. Um, when you were giving examples about uh, they won't get to enjoy a, whatever, a hot shower or whatever, <laughs> a warm meal, whatever it is, are, were you saying that the, those examples are actually better examples than the, oh, they'll never get to see their whatever grow up or, or that, or, or is that the same sort of example? I, uh, well, they're both uh, describing possible states of affairs that haven't happened. So right. in that sense, I'm not ranking those uh, states of affairs. I'm not saying that no you know, yeah. warm showers are better or worse than seeing your <laughs> grandchildren grow up or whatever, but they're all just possible states of affairs. Okay, so and this could just be me being slow here. It just um, so what? So you're taking aim at this idea that uh, people are harmed by missing out on what they could have had were they alive. Yeah, the coulda, woulda, shouldas of okay. life. So uh, the, either the of things those that don't happen. Really. Yeah. So typically, okay. um, one temptation is to think that um, it's in virtue of. Uh, deprivations that death harms the one who dies because you're you might be somewhat desperate trying to identify what else you know uh, it's it's all too tempting to derive an epicurean conclusion that perhaps death doesn't harm you at all uh, if not for these deprivations these these possible lives and in fact uh, one um, extra tempting reason to think that deprivations do account for the harm of death is you might think there's a way of quantifying uh, these kind of counterfactual comparisons to figure out the magnitude of the harm of death. So you might think, for instance, uh, it would be sensible to ask how harmful was this person's death at time T relative to some earlier or later time. 
um, uh, well, it would sorry, it wouldn't be relative to earlier later times. It'd be relative to other counterfactual possible deaths. So, um, imagine um, your friend uh, dies at eighteen years of age. How harmful was that death for that person at that time? Well, that question on this view of deprivationism would be answered by looking at some relevant counterfactual and comparing uh, the the two lives. Now, sometimes they uh, these different theories compare the whole uh, total. Uh, life. So if you think about uh, like a graph of someone's uh, life uh, where you have a, the ex access being time from birth to actual death, and then you uh, have the y-axis compare, you know, net value at a time, uh, if that even makes sense, where you can think about every moment of your life as being uh, uh, somewhat good or somewhat bad. Um, and, and you could sum total uh, these uh, dimensions of value such that there would be some uh, sensible vector unit, you might call it, with a magnitude and a direction, which would identify how well off you are at any given time uh, when you're 12 uh, at, on your birthday at time at noon or something versus the day after at noon. Um, and uh, how well off you are at any given time would be represented on this graph. And um, what you could do is you can sum total uh, your, your well-being curve uh, from birth to death and uh, have some numerical value uh, yeah. W for total well-being in your life. And then what you could ask yourself is, well, how well off was that life in total? How many units of value did that uh, life uh, well-lived produce? Um, and there may be some moments where you're net negative, uh, perhaps at the end of your life, uh, you're in constant suffering or something. And um, what you can do is you just sum total what, what the total lifetime well-being score would be. And now, you know, like a credit score or some other score. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and what's crazy about these views is it's not just a heuristic. They think it's literally true that, you no, know, there is a definite fact of the matter um, that, you know, so like uh, Ben Bramble has a view like this. Um, but um, I would argue that, um, well, so, so, I mean, many views in literature are committed to something of this picture, perhaps uh, not with such... Uh, well, uh, this is... This... This is not even and, that that uh, sorry to cut you off. This is the no, coming to mind that this is not even that different than uh, a lot of mainstream conversations that happened during COVID when people were arguing about whether it was worth uh, shutting society down for um, uh, everybody, given the value of a whatever a child's an hour of a child's time versus an hour of a senior's time, and or an hour of a middle aged person's time versus an hour of a senior's time. Uh, so, so these types of uh, uh, graphs that you're talking about, and these types of arguments, have real world impact on decision making. Yeah, yeah, actually, there's a really good book on saving people from the harm of death, which looks at the implications of these theories of mortal harm to uh, population ethics as well as to bioethics and uh, healthcare policy. And I think that's that's really interesting, especially for um, play, like the Canadian healthcare system and its. Um, it's informative for that uh, debate as to what how to value the possible deaths of of people in euthanasia programs um to just you know call a spade a spade um, yeah we <laughs> i got a lot of thoughts about that one having to live with the canadian healthcare system uh, but uh, i'll i'll withhold or, those for now <laughs> or 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 die die with the canadian yes, healthcare system yes yeah more uh, likely yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah well but uh, the thing is the funny thing is that philosophers have been something of the darling child of of many of these uh um, technocrats in, in this regard, and I'm something of a skeptic myself. Uh, but but um, the, the the putting the the practical implications aside for the moment, just thinking of it theoretically, you you already have significant problems. So first off, that that well being is even quantifiable in the way necessary for the graph to even make sense. Uh, I, I think it does make sense some sense as a rough heuristic, but to literalize the metaphor, where this isn't just a heuristic anymore, this is a literal fact of the matter, which is yeah. definite, is deeply problematic. Um, uh, utilitarianism always has already has a problem with interpersonal utility comparisons, let alone th this kind. I mean, it's just straight out of utilitarianism. Uh, now, it needn't be committed to a utilitarian worldview or a utilitarian analysis of the uh, what makes right uh, actions right, but um, the, there is um, quite a lot of assumptions being baked into a graph. Um, but there's a, an additional problem where, uh, where, just to finish the story I was making earlier, where um, you ask yourself, um, how harmful was the death? And in order for that question to have answered, the, the, the deprivationists readily have answers to that question. They say, well, just look at the relevant counterfactual. Uh, 
with, to determine uh, the magnitude of the harm. So that's why they sometimes they, uh, they call themselves comparativists. So they compare uh, the life you would have lived had you not died at that time with the life you actually did live. And the difference in well-being scores determines the magnitude uh, of uh, inversely determines the magnitude of the harm. Uh, so if you would have lived a really good life, but you died prematurely, uh, intuitively, just to speak in favor of the view, uh, it, it seems to get it, the, some of the facts right about the harm of death, that we seem to think that um, if you would have lived a really good life, that makes the death worse than if you would have lived a mediocre couch potato life, then the death was still be bad, but not as bad as if you were a spectacular hero of the people or what have you, right? Um, or if you would have been Adolf Hitler, maybe it would have been better if you died earlier. Well, that, yeah, uh, no, than, now we're getting, th th sorry to cut you off again, but this is even, I think we're bordering into the other topic, which is the antinatalism too, which also has this type of uh, formulaic way of deciding what's good and bad and and uh, coming out with a net answer at the end it's of, of some kind, right? So, Well, antinatalism is weird because it's, it's interestingly different because at least Benatar uh, doesn't engage in these kinds of... Uh, the calculations he explicitly denies that because otherwise it would it wouldn't be antinatalism it wouldn't even get off the ground you just compare uh, uh if i'm thinking about having a child if and i had a crystal ball that would tell me exactly how the child's life would go in some deterministic universe where the fi future's already fixed in some sense there's a fact of the matter about there being only one possible future which is already problematic but let's just uh, say that th there's a fact of the matter about that determinism is true and there's only one possible future and you have a crystal ball. And of course it's determined whether or not you're actually going to have the child. So uh, I'm not sure what deliberation has to do with this, but, sure, let's, but yeah. let's, set, yeah. let's say it's an imperfect crystal ball. You don't know whether uh, you're going to have the child or not. And you think you can deliberate and make a choice <laughs> about yeah. uh, whether to have the child or not. And uh, yet you can peer into the crystal ball and see uh, the child's life ahead of you. And you're trying to assess whether it would be a good or bad thing. Uh, perhaps you're not making a choice. Perhaps, you know, uh, it's determined. So uh, you're merely um, um, uh, trying to make an assessment of whether it's a good thing that you will have a child given that you will um, or not. And um, uh, you look into the crystal ball and you see the lifetime well-being score and uh, the graph. You see the graph from birth to death. Yeah. And um, in, in that scenario, what makes it strange is that Benatar doesn't compare, he, you know, he doesn't uh, just weigh up all the goods and bads. And, you know, if it's not positive, have the child. He doesn't do that. Uh, and it's partly because he, he, he has an interesting asymmetry between um, the presence. Let's see if I get this right. But I mean, yeah, he, he, he considers does. the presence and absence yeah. of pain and pleasure. And he thinks it's relevantly asymmetric. That's that right. The presence of pain is worse than the absence of pleasure. Now, to me, though, that is just doing arithmetic again about pain and pleasure, right? So he he does do that sort of move. Um, yeah, you might not, think if it is worse, yeah, let's just weight the variables to create he, a different function. From what I recall, and geez, we had weeks between our conversations. You think I would have been smart enough to look it up? But from what I recall, yeah, it, it, he has a formula of, of pain and pleasure. And the asymmetry is that he seems to think that there is always more pain than pleasure in life um and he does arrive there by some kind of arithmetic although it might not be as let's say mathematical uh, as what you're describing um with the you know number of utils and we can do that over course of time that, that type of thing um he he well, but yeah i actually i don't i want to correct that i, I mean sure. I, I don't think benatar is committed to the view or even thinks uh, although I, I can't speak for him, that uh, pay, uh, life overall is more painful than pleasurable uh, in terms of its presence. It's not so much how painful life is or how pleasure it, it's the question is, uh, w w what does it matter? So it the, the that there will be a bit of pain in life matters more at inception, uh, and that's determinative, even. It matters so much that there will be some presence of pain, but it doesn't matter at all that there will be an absence. Uh, of pleasure, um, right. or con conversely, uh, it, um, it it does matter that there will be a presence of pleasure, but 
it, it doesn't matter. It matters much, so much more that there's an absence of pain. And the best way to ensure that there's an absence of pain is just not have the child. Yeah. So, I, and, and you know what, I actually don't think that is disagreeing with what I'm I'm saying, I think it's more just explaining the waiting, the waiting method that Benatar uses in his arithmetic oh, okay. than it is yeah. doing anything else, right? So he he has, it seems like, if I can sum up um, and, and meld the two conversations together, there's a whole class of, of people who might weight things differently and, and might um, uh, d disagree on uh, how to describe the relevant metrics. But they do engage in some kind of arithmetic to figure out whether it's good to be alive or not, <laughs> or whether if they're making it's... a judgment. They have to have some waiting function, you might think. You know, it, it, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's true actually. But um, if you're going to make well, an arithmetical yeah. judgment, you're going to have to, right? If you're sure. going to, if you're going to aggregate something or not even do that, if you're going to just say. Uh, one ounce of this is equal to ten ounces of that. Then yes, you're you're going to have to. Well, it doesn't have to be fully explicit or before one's mind. I mean, I I don't agree that there has to be a definite function either. But but just think when you're weighing lives and you're thinking, should I have a child, or should I not have a child? Well, I think a natural thought is to think, what kind of life can, you know, if at this time especially, or should I wait to have a child until later in life, or should I have the child now, or just no child at all? And I think it is natural to try to compare. Uh, how how well off the kid would be, what kind of life would they live if you were to have the child now as opposed to later. Um, and I think people do make those kinds of uh, considerations. I wouldn't call it a calculation because it may not be quantified in their mind. Yeah. Um, but at least if if they're deliberating about it. Now, I think most people just have children by accident. You know, <laughs> like I think just that happens, happens a lot, yeah. <laughs> sort uh, of set up for that. The, <laughs> the thoughtful people who actually, you know, like uh, if you ever, you know, parents who, uh, yeah, it's a small minority, but there's a substantial minority of people, at least in developed nations, who are seeking services of IVF. Um, sure. And perhaps they might regret waiting too long, uh, but that, or maybe they had difficulty conceiving, and this is the reason for using it. And 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 that, and I think there's quite a lot of thought uh, in in those kinds of scenarios. So it may not be it may not be ar arithmetic though. <laughs> yeah. And it seems, seems to almost, um, there's something mistaken. It's like one thought too many. The the person who um, engages in some sort of cold-hearted calculus uh, um, is making some kind of moral mistake. Yeah, and in, again, I, I can think know. of other, I'm not saying I endorse any of, of these uh, these other options, but I can think of more deontological, uh, blah, de <laughs> A deontology way of coming at this, a deontological way of coming at this. A deontological Jeez. way of. Thank yeah. you. That's no, right. Um, yeah. You know where you're not even going to make a calculation. It's just like this is this is your duty, uh, and it maybe I have an explanation for why it's your duty. Maybe it's God or genetics or whatever. Um, but then you, I don't think you're really in the the realm of arithmetical uh, operations here. Uh, now somebody could just say, well, you're weighting something all in one direction, but I know that 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 characterization would not be agreed to by like a Christian, for example. <laughs> Procreate, procreative yeah. ethics is an interesting topic. I mean, that's yeah. something I might want to look into in the future. I mean, but um, it, it is a bit puzzling wondering, well, duty to who? I mean, it, in some ways, this is the Christian has the easiest answer, just duty to God to procreate and yeah. be fruitful and multiply or whatever. But exactly. you know, suppose, suppose you're an atheist and you don't think there is a God. Um, sure. Then you might wonder as to, uh, you know, you might think, okay, well, we have a, it just seems prudent to ensure that there's uh, the survival of the species, uh, but that's kind of an imperfect duty. It doesn't really matter who, um, what matters more is that someone perpetuate the species uh, and it may fall on your shoulders or not. And um, perhaps there's other ways of discharging that duty. Um, so, yeah. I mean, that seems to be uh, many people in academia, for instance, have such a uh, emphasis on the career and they've made sacrifices to, uh, for the sake of their career in order to uh, pursue this dream of, of being a philosopher. So um, that's well, frequent. I guess where, where I'm going with this is like, okay, um, you, I'm sensing skepticism on your side with uh, not, not with Benatar, or the antinatalism so much as just these, the type of thinking where it's a, the deprivationist, I think you called them, whether they're going to add up how much you're not getting. And this is I mean, why my, death my is cartoon. Bad. My cartoon right. deprivationist. I didn't yeah. name names on that particular no, thing, but no, I know no, I have a few yeah. authors, uh, particularly in mind, who actually do make these 
and actually argue that that's an advancement that you know having a way of quantifying the harm of death is is uh is a good thing that's not a that's a um that's a feature it's not a bug right so okay so what is the other the the what's the um we we have this other option uh in the procreation ethics realm of like hey god said you should do it what's the other option in the death realm as to why this is bad for people then what you said what would you call it destructivism yeah i'm just an, an actualist about harm so okay. i think if you just ask yourself what is a deprivation what does it mean so if i deprive my plant of water and it dies um what what does it mean for me to have deprived the plant it means that there's some possible state of affairs like or some possible event like um, the watering of the plant that did not happen in the actual sequence of events and that's what deprivations are if you ask me i don't think of deprivations i think of them counterfactually i don't think of deprivations as like a valley amidst some hills where the valley is the absence of a mountain or the absence of dirt and that absence insofar as a valley is an absence is an actual thing a deprivation is not an absence. It is. It is a kind of absence. It's not uh, like a valley, though. It's 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 a counterfactual state of affairs in which um, something doesn't happen. Uh, something what actually happens isn't the case. So you are deprived of water uh, when you you could have been given water, but you weren't. Mm -hmm. So and, is there is there a teleological aspect of that then? Like, hey, the plant is supposed to grow. <laughs> like leaving aside any you know uh, religious implications to this or anything it's just like the purpose of the plant is to grow it needs water to do that it's not getting the water and it's going to be destroyed and that's why it's bad is it it's, it's, it's an interesting question i mean i i think uh for that particular example i i mean i think that's um quite a commitment if you think that you know especially if you're objectivist about teleology mm -hmm. um I, i'm sympathetic to some extent, because my advisor is an Aristotelian, but and <laughs> I just yeah. being just studying at Florida State, it's kind of some of Aristotle rubbed off on me. But uh, I'm not uh, like a dogmatic Aristotelian. I just have some sympathies, but I, I don't I don't think so. I mean, it's it, because uh, you say that. I mean, so if if it, I don't think a deprivation is committed to that kind of teleology, because uh, first off, I think many would be skeptical of that. But but also, um, you know, uh, um, when death deprives you. Death may deprive you in some sense, in, in, in the most natural way. I mean, at least there seems like there would have to be some work done to explain why someone with childhood leukemia, uh, or even, not even, uh, that that's an aberration case. So let's think of like just dying of old age, so to speak, or you have heart disease at age 65. Um, maybe you can give a theological explanation for how death has deprived you. I haven't heard of that. I, mean, I think it's an interesting idea. Well, you can I use mean, it. I, I, you can use it if it, you it, like it. <laughs> well, thank you, but but no, I <laughs> yeah, just I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it it seems to put a constraint, a narrows the concept of what a deprivation is, such that certain absences would not constitute deprivations if they're not in line with the teleology of the thing. That is to say, the way it's supposed to be, or or it's um it's uh, a form of what it is that it contains um how it's supposed to be. Uh, well, you could even say that's why a like that. aging is bad because I mean, uh, you know, human beings are 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 we're, whatever we're supposed to serve all these rational functions, and as we age, we can't do them anymore, and that interferes with our telos, and so I don't even know if um, yeah. yeah 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 anyway I think it's it's like there's somewhere to proceed with that anyway as an alternative to a utilitarian view as to why death is bad. Well, no, I think that's good. That's but yeah. that I I would say that's a, a further specification of the concept of haves. I'm just I'm just an actualist about harm sure. and harm making. So I just think that what uh, makes death harm you is not a possible state of affairs. It's what actually happens, and um, what makes um, I don't think what makes aging bad is falling from your or, or failing for your telos or uh, falling short of what the kind of being you ought to be. I mean, maybe that could be the case, but I think that would be a specification of what is good for you, right? So I think a teleologist of this sort would be someone who would think that um, what is good for you is fulfilling your telos, right? And and that explains why um, 
why aging is harmful because it's it's not that there's some good thing you could do like you know you could write a book and you can fulfill your telos right it's that uh there's something special about fulfilling your telos that distinguishes it from just writing a book or you know playing a video game uh where you are fulfilling who you are or what you are in some deep uh way um yeah. that is not not the case for playing a video game um and so uh i would say that's just a further specification because i don't want to be a partisan about goodness um okay. you know and, and that's a common i think assumption in this literature where uh if someone says death harms you in virtue of what it deprives you of uh they don't uh, they're not a partisan as to what kinds of things are what kinds of things a deprivation would be bad for versus good for you right so if you're deprived of torturing and you other otherwise would go around torturing innocent people uh typically people don't speak that way they, they don't think oh yeah. there's all these they only speak of deprivations of good things right they don't say well because uh somebody went in the time travel machine and killed adolf hitler uh, he was deprived of committing the holocaust right uh, particularly because the committing the Holocaust was horrible and not just horrible for the victims, but also horrible for Hitler in some ways. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That, no, that's interesting. Cause it's, yeah, it's a way of pushing back on that teleological. Sort well, of, I don't, uh, I don't yeah. dispute it though, because I think, yeah. I think that that could be right. Um, but yeah. I, I guess I, I just wouldn't want to be committed to um, something as, as robust as, as, you know, sticking my neck out and saying, we have a Talos and this yeah, is why yeah, yeah, we yeah, shouldn't yeah. die. And yeah. also furthermore, I'm, I, I'm, uh, we haven't gotten into this, but I, I actually would prefer if I were immortal, uh, and where I'm not, and I couldn't be, but you know, okay, why don't, good... why don't you, why don't you tell me about why you prefer to be immortal? I think, well, I think I think that's agree a basic you. commitment. And then, I think that's a basic commitment of fear sure. of death, right? So I think yeah. uh, if you think death would be bad for you, uh, the harm of death does not have an expiration date. And what that would commit you to is preferring, at least rationally, uh, to not ever die, which is what it means to be Im the, immortal. The only objection I can think to uh, think of about this, and I'm not sure it's a good one, but it's the only thing that pops to my mind, is the the star trek uh character q who lives for so long and has done everything possible in the universe they just wants to to not exist anymore <laughs> was the episode on voyager wasn't it quinn yeah something like that yeah yeah so you ever heard the phrase that there are no boring nothing is boring there's just boring people oh yes no boring <laughs> things there's just boring people yeah i think there's something something true about that if not literally then at least it's um the topic of boredom is is its own thing i mean i was writing something on this last year and then i had some health issues and i had to postpone everything but um the um the relevant article here is a really influential piece by bernard williams on the mercopolis case and he argues among many things that uh death is what gives us meaning in life um and that um that immortality is not desirable it's not uh worth desiring because it would be boring and it, it, the thing is about boredom you might think well why not just take like a pill like you know there's antidepressants why not just take an anti-boredom pill uh, maybe if there's not one now they could develop one uh anti-ennui right right um well that's Nose um, Nose experience machine let's just plug you into that well but the Whatever. problem is that um <laughs> williams's argument is um deeper than that it's not merely arguing that uh, immortality isn't worth wanting because we just get bored eventually which is something of an empirical claim uh he's arguing that whatever makes life good is depletable and if given enough time would eventually be depleted you know like butter scraped over too much bread to use tokens uh, sure. metaphor and uh we what we're doing with an immortal life is we're taking tokens uh bread and we're only have finitely much butter and we're spreading out the bread infinitely far in one direction. And uh, there's no reason to keep living. Now that Williams is not advocating for suicide uh, for the immortals like Macropolis to eventually kill themselves. He just thinks they have no reason to continue. And his argument for that is based on this somewhat confusing and confused notion of categorical desire. There's certain desires uh, that are different than other uh, more conditional desires that um, uh, are what make life worth living. 
And it, the examples he gives for these are, are things that are typically like achievements or um, like uh, completing a personal project of some kind. Um, and um, when we are, uh, uh, th those are, there's only so many of those types of desires that we can have. And once we've uh, satisfied them, there's really no, nothing further propelling us into the future. And uh, I think um, uh, John Martin Fisher has a pretty persuasive response to that, which is um, why not just cycle, cycle your pleasures or cycle your projects. Um, you know, that um, at least that's his response. So I'm not sure that it's the most satisfying response, but uh, he thinks that um, the problem is uh, Williams is looking at it as, as a kind of like a single thing where instead what um, we should be doing, you could vary up your projects. And uh, of course, no one project or no one activity will be endlessly fascinating to beings like us, which seems to be what Williams is saying. Uh, we may not just do math or we may not just read Shakespeare forever, uh, but we cycle things and, and, well, and in virtue of the mix up, that's what can make it, a more life worth living. It, so, it sounds like one of them is thinking about um, uh, things as like a zero sum thing that can be diluted, right? And the other one is thinking, well, look, the longer you live, the more options there are going to be to do different things. We can't even imagine the things that you could do in 100, 200, a million years from now, right? So it seems a little short-sighted to say that, hey, we're diluting with a point of life um, uh, by making it longer. We Maybe we don't know that. Maybe we would be infinitely interested in all kinds of different stuff over time as it came up. Is that sort well, of... Right. So I coined this phrase. Um, I like to distinguish between different types of goods, between uh, the depletable, the repetitive, and the amplitude of goods. So there may be uh, some good things like licks of the lollipop. There may be some number of licks of the lollipop at which point uh, it is not contributing any value to your life as a whole. And those we might describe as depletable. Even if we cycle things out, even if we only try a lollipop every 10 years or 20 years or 100 years, uh, eventually there will come a point at which the value contribution to your life as a whole is depleted to uh, negligible, if not no zero uh, levels. However, uh, there may be uh, uh, repetitive uh, goods, um, things where, you know, once every century you can repeat and it would uh, make a non-negligible contribution to your life as a whole in terms of its value. Uh, but there may be amplitude of goods. So I think that the virtues uh, the moral virtues are like this, that no matter how many acts of justice or courage and kindness you you perform, uh, that you uh, the value to your life as a whole by instantiating and exemplifying the virtues uh, only increases the, the more virtuous you become. And so uh, by repeating uh, virtuous action, uh, this um, has a, a kind of uh, amplitude effect on, on your life as a whole that... Um, is inexhaustible. And actually, um, uh, this is, uh, I was somewhat inspired by a, a colleague of mine, uh, or a former graduate student, uh, at the time is, uh, Marshall Thompson. He had this really interesting response article to, uh, Martha Nussbaum's criticisms of, uh, why, uh, virtue, moral virtue would not be possible in heaven. Although Marshall himself is, uh, uh, deeply Christian. I'm not, I'm, I'm secular. Uh, but I think there is something to the point that uh, there are certain types of goods, like the moral virtues, which uh, get better with practice, uh, so to speak. And I think uh, by focusing only on pleasure, John Martin Fisher makes the mistake of uh, focusing on some sense on the worst or the lowest quality <laughs> of good thing. Uh, right. The easiest to come in mind as an example, but pleasures may be depletable uh, in so, insofar as their value contribution to your life as your whole. There's only so many pleasures you can feel. Uh, in which I think it has a, a marginal rate of return, so to speak. Yeah, well, uh, we're going to have to wrap up in a minute, but I guess the last thing I'll, I'll say on this is that um, I notice as I get older, and uh, I just turned 40, um, so I'm not right smack in the middle, I hope. Um, <laughs> there, were, there were at least a, a little bit before I, that. I, I won't that's, reveal my age then. That's like, you know. <laughs> sorry well i i notice though as as i get older i have less and less interest in things that i used to find uh fun uh video games or 
television or whatever. Honestly, they, they don't grip me like they used to. Um, um, and certain things become more important as you, as you age. And it's like, I used to wonder that about my dad. He used to work all the time. And I say that lovingly, like he's fantastic. Right. And, um, uh, I thought, yeah, he never cares if he's playing a video game or whatever. He's just working all the time. But th I think that's what he enjoyed doing. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm more like that when I'm in my middle age. And so it becomes easier to work all the time because that, that feels more meaningful. Um, And by virtue of doing work, you're usually making a difference in something, right? Like you're improving something in some way, even maybe just yourself. And that has become more interesting. When I turned 30, that type of thing became way more interesting to me. And yeah, I, I do wonder, like if I had, you know, a few hundred years more, uh, I know we're talking about immortality, but I'll keep it even on just like an intuitive timeline for a human being. Like uh, how much more work and how on myself and other things I could do and what kind of person I would be if I if I even knew that that was coming. It's an interesting thought experiment. But let let, let me give you the last word on that and anything else you want, and then we'll we'll have to wrap up. Okay. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, well, at least in, in regards to, there, there may very well be uh, different um, virtues for different times of life, at least in, in, I don't know, the virtues of character, but at least the different um, um, appropriate characteristic activities for certain ages of life. And perhaps, uh, you know, things like play is going to be, whether it's video games or, or just playing tag with your friends, is going to be uh, much more Uh, not just fascinating, but worthy of fascination for 12-year-olds and 10-year-olds. And uh, perhaps they're fulfilling their telos of, of uh, not just as the life of a whole, but the, the age-appropriate uh, activities. Right. And those, what, what, which activities are age-appropriate may vary from age to age. Um, I know Aristotle definitely mentioned that, you know, he, uh, he reserves uh, studying, uh, 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 or both him and Plato uh, mentioned um, the study of mathematics for the youth. Uh, philosophy is not for the young. Um, and perhaps uh, as Aristotle, I think alludes to uh, um, a study of divinity or, or theology should be best done in old age, <laughs> right, right before <laughs> yeah. you die. Uh, but I, I actually, um, um, th I think it would be a wonderful ex exploration. Uh, I, I think we, we do, Uh, have something of an obligation to extend the lives of actual people because we actually matter um, as opposed to merely possible people who don't yet matter, but could matter if they were actual. Um, so um, insofar as that could be done so much, the better for us. Uh, but um, I think it, it's also, it would be an interesting discovery to figure out what kinds of literature could be written by a thousand year old beings versus uh, 50 year olds. Yeah. Um, let alone, and of course, you know, even if the technology were possible, it would be a thousand years until we discover this. Um, I, I think that uh, there could be um, great uh, mountains of, of virtue or, or well being or excellence in many ways that, you know, skill. Uh, if you admire someone for uh, their excellence and skill, imagine what a, per a perpetually young person who has a mountain of experience. Uh, Not to mention the death of living memory, which is horrific. Uh, yeah. With each generation as it passes, uh, the living memories of the past fade with them. Um, so I think uh, I, I think I'm just defending common sense uh, against the um, idiosyncratic implications of um, certain uh, philosophies, you might call them, or, or certain schools of thought, which I think have um, kind of lost touch with. What, with uh, what makes death so scary and um, and that life so good? Yeah. Okay. That's perfect. I think that that clarifies a lot of things. That was a really good way to end that. So, good job, Matthew. <laughs> on on that book, and then I thank you for being on the uh, podcast. And I, um, uh, unless you wanted to plug anything, we'll just uh, call it a day. Oh, just my own podcast on uh, mortality matters, death and okay. meaning. All right. Thanks. See you soon again, everybody.